Our second scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. It's actually a continuation of what Mary Marshall was reading. This is all the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And a portion that I want to read this morning is building upon what she read first. Jesus starts out with the Beatitudes, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a minute. But he also talks about a ton of different things, about how to be a Christian, about how to live the Christian life, and one that Bill and I thought was incredibly applicable to all of us, no matter the age and no matter the stage, was in chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, when Jesus talks about what it is like to pray. Let us listen to a word from our Lord through the writer of Matthew and the words of our Lord Jesus. Jesus said, whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. Sometimes they like to stand at the street corners so that they can be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But whenever you pray, go to your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, how will be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you know this, but there are two perks to being a pastor. There's more perks, but there are two that I want to talk about. To you about this morning. I never have to think about what I'm going to wear on Sundays, and I never have to think about where I'm going to sit. Now, that might not seem like much to you, but those are actually really big decisions. See, I have outfits. You may have this too. I have outfits that make me feel confident and comfortable. Conversely, I have shirts that don't quite fit right, and you'll know I'm wearing one because I'm constantly fidgeting with it and trying to make it right. Now, I've often wondered, where would I worship best if I wasn't up here, though? If I didn't always have to sit in this particular spot. So I started thinking this past week, and I thought, I'd love to be a member of that back row crew. I like having everybody in front of me so that I can scan the congregation and make sure everyone is staying on task. Right, ladies? I also love being the first one out, being able to make a quick exit if need be, let's be honest. Now, I also imagined setting an example for you all this morning, and I was going to sit in the front pew. I am easily distracted, and this would minimize my desire to look at everyone to see what they're wearing and whether they're opening their hymnals to sing, and plus I would be ruled by the rules of Southern propriety that dictate don't ever turn around to look what's going on behind you. I also wondered maybe the choir's the best place for me. Joining the group would push me to be a better singer. And they also, you don't know this, but they also don't have to worry about what they wear on Sunday mornings. Not only that, I think it would be fun to join the other choir members who, whether they admit it or not, are taking role right now during worship. Then there's the middle pack. You know you all. Neither front rowers, not back rowers. And you're probably there because of what you've told me, tradition. Your parents always sat there, you grew up sitting there, it was the only open seat at one point, and and you sit there because that's where you raised your kids there, and it's just comfortable. And there's something appealing about that comfortable to me. Then I just got all off track, and I started to wonder, do I sit on the outside? Well, it could get too hot or too cold based on, are you going to get over here where the sun is in the mornings, or over here where it's hotter? Do you sit on the inside? It's not as easy to get out that way. 
Now, you may not have thought as much about this as I have, but there are so many decisions to make as soon as one walks into church. In fact, there are decisions to be made before you even leave your own house. And what I want to say to you this morning is that they're big decisions. They're important decisions because they do something for you. They help you find your place in this community of faith. This is a big part of the Christian life, finding your place in the community of faith. And what we often find as we think about finding our place in this community of faith or any community of faith is that we tend to lean toward an understanding that it is our initiative. It comes from within to find our own space in the community. So we test out where to sit. We test out what to wear. And because we are Presbyterian, we test out what committee should we join. And all of these conversations rely heavily on your own initiative. You find a place to sit. You figure out what you need to wear. You figure out where you can serve best. And then Christ starts preaching. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And suddenly there's this space and this place in the community of faith that opens up. And we didn't do anything to create it. We didn't do anything to carve it out. And then Christ keeps preaching and he says, blessed are. And there's a few more spaces that start to open up. And we hear, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for you will be comforted. And more spaces start to open up. And then Christ's preaching of the kingdom of God comes into each of our lives. It opens up a space for you to assume, for me to assume, for everyone to assume. And here is the best part, folks. We are invited to come just as we are. You don't have to move spots. You don't have to change clothes. You don't have to change which committees you're on. There's no entry fee. There's no test to pass. There is no litmus test or financial or health check. It is truly come as you are. Now, this might not seem like an incredibly drastic invitation to us because the idea of come as you are is something we hear more often than they did back in the day. Churches say it all the time. Many businesses are starting to say it. Other places are saying, come as you are. But this is new to the ancient community. It was a monumental shift to those who first heard Jesus' words. These are the poorest of the poor. These are the ones who are considered outcasts. They couldn't catch a break. They were tired. They were hungry. They were sad. They were too weak to defend themselves or their own lives. And they were always looking for something to get them out of that hole. And then Jesus said, blessed are you. Blessed are you, he said to them. I have to imagine at least one of the persons in that community that was listening said, okay, Jesus, that's great, but what's the kicker? What do I got to do? I get that you're saying that I'm blessed, but what do I have to do now? You just get to inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus says. You, you get to be comforted if you're mourning. You get to see God if you're a peacemaker. You, you get rewarded for the hard work you're already doing. That's what's the kicker. It probably took them some time to realize that these aren't just words. These are invitations to see one's self as a part of Christ's kingdom. Hearing that makes these words come alive in our own lives. In the 21st century, this is a drastic invitation. And here's why. Because when I think about where I might sit or the clothes that I might wear to church, I'm often thinking about how I can impress. We all know that words are only a part of the conversation that we have with one another, right? Where we sit says something about us. What we wear says something about us. And I often think that if I sit in the right spot or I wear the right things, then things will start to go well for me. And then Christ's words strike my ears, and I pray they have struck yours as well. Blessed are you who sit on the back row, 
Blessed are you who sit in the middle or on the side or on the aisle or in the choir loft or in the front row or in a middle row or wherever it is that you are seated today. Blessed are you because where you are is where God has met you. And I don't know if you can hear this, but God has blessed you as well. Now I know this, I know you know this as well, but we still worry. I know God is blessing me, but, but, but Ben... I'm not in the best place in this season of my life. I'm tired. My kids are hard to handle. My life is all over the place. Blessed are you, Jesus says. We don't have as much money to give right now and our time is constrained. Blessed are you. We don't always pay attention and we're often pulled in thousand different directions. Blessed are you. Did you hear it? This is the Christian life. Knowing that you are blessed because God loves each of you for where you are and for who you are. Blessed are you. I told the Tuesday morning men's Bible study this week, if you want to know how to be a Christian, read the Sermon on the Mount. And know that you're blessed. And then I told them, if you really want to be a Christian, then go live it. And then you'll notice that the Sermon on the Mount doesn't end with the Beatitudes. And as Carrie pointed out, it's really hard. In fact, it's impossible. Because Jesus dives into the realities of being a Christian and discusses topics ranging from fasting to divorce, oath-taking, anger, retaliation, love for your enemies, prayer, and many, many more. So when you realize you're blessed simply because of who you are and where you sit or where you stand in the world, Jesus reminds you that you can do the work of the kingdom right there. That's what it means to live the Christian life. It doesn't mean you need to move spaces right now unless you want to. It doesn't mean you need to change clothes unless you want to. There's no need to get more degrees or change anything about your social location, your financial situation. You can actually do God's work right where you are, by right who you are. And that's the message for all of us today, especially this day when we are going to ordain and install a new session, who's going to lead us into the future. They have everything they need. Adam, Bill, Bonnie, David, Diane, Debbie, Gary, Harry, Hazel, Faye, Jim, Kelly, Michael, and Susan, You all are blessed, and I hope you know it. You are blessed, and that blessing involves being called to be the session for this season of life. You all have all the tools and the resources and the gifts to lead God's people. And everybody else who's too many to name, we the congregation know that we are blessed as well. And that we're blessed not simply because we have 15 other people to do the work, but because we're called to do the work of the kingdom right where you're sitting and right where you are living. That day when Jesus began preaching on a mountaintop, he opened the world up to a new possibility. One where it didn't matter what you wore, it didn't matter where you sat, it didn't matter who you were. It just mattered that God loved you and that you mattered to God and God had blessed you for who you were and where you were. And then from there, Jesus taught us how to do God's work. That's the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. From there, we learn that we all have a place in God's kingdom. We are all called to live the Christian life. Read the Sermon on the Mount. The blueprint is right there. Now let's go live it. Thanks be to God. Amen.